very thorough introduction. Uh, appreciate it uh, very, very much. Uh, and I want to thank you for all you did to, to contribute to the, the last uh, King's Connections Conference and all you're doing there at King's. Um, the United States and the United Kingdom have uh, worked together for many, many years, and we've met a lot of challenges. And uh, all the folks on this call, I think, are needed if we're going to get to the future that we all want. And speaking of that, uh, since we have such a diverse audience, I tried to find something that, that everyone could relate to. And I think everybody over a certain age remembers the space age. People even younger than that have certainly uh, heard about it and, and, and got from their uh, elders uh, feeling for the excitement and everything else. Uh, that was captured very well in the book, The Right Stuff, in the movie. Uh, and one of the things that became very clear in that movie was just how dangerous it was to be a test pilot in the years just before the, the, the space program. Now, a test pilot was always a dangerous job, but it wasn't that dangerous. You tried to get the best pilots, uh, and you sort of, you had a pretty good idea for what to expect when you would be testing a new aircraft because wind tunnels actually predate airplanes. The Wright brothers used a wind tunnel to accelerate the perfection of the, the first practical aircraft. Um, all sides in World War II used increasingly sophisticated aircraft. But what changed was that when you got to transonic and supersonic speeds, the wind tunnels that were never exactly the same as, as the actual data from actual aircraft became much less close. And so the, the test pilots had to cope with a great deal more unknown than usual. And, and uh, that was why the, the death rate was so much higher. So a tool that had been very, very helpful for, for 40 years, the tool hadn't changed, but the, the challenges changed. And I think that's a good analogy to wargaming. We'll, we'll show in the next few minutes that war games that worked perfectly well were no longer as effective, sometimes because the situation changed, sometimes because the adversaries caught up or pulled ahead in wargaming. So as Ivanka said, I have three main things I'm gonna be talking about. Um, evolving wargaming to better fit the need has helped nations to outthink and outcompete in the past. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives that have been underway for the last decade or two that have been helping, but we do need to take additional steps. And uh, the first part of this talk is going to cover about 6,000 years of wargaming in about 15 minutes. So, so buckle up, I'm going to be going very fast. Uh, the first two thirds of my book is on the history of wargaming. I have a talk I give on the history of wargaming. If I don't leave chunks out, it takes about two hours. I'm going to do 15 minutes. So again, buckle up. Okay. Uh, and when I say going back 6,000 years, I mean it. That wargaming is literally as old as civilization. Most historians define the birth of civilization as the birth of cities. And a, a leading contender for the title of oldest city is Ur. Well, a, a first-generation war game, a, an abstract game, was found in the uh, ruins of Ur. And, and not just Ur, Egypt, India, China, many, many of the early civilizations, uh, all the major early civilizations, had strategy games. And it makes sense because if, if you're the son of a pharaoh or king or emperor, you need to learn how to out and out-compete the other sons of the pharaohs and emperors, and, and back then it tended to be the sons. Um, and, and this was the way it was for, for, for many centuries, that war games tended to be uh, something used by the, the ruling classes to help prepare their young. That started to change. It started to change with the advent of second generation war games that, that simulated the fire and movement and limited intelligence of warfare. And, and this charming young gentleman uh, uh, was uh, Hermit von Mulkey was one of the people that helped to change. Uh, there was a father and son team called Reichwitz. The father came up with really the first unambiguous uh, second generation war game. But like many inventions, uh, uh, 
uh, you tend to use new stuff to do old things better. So it was initially used to train the, the Apologies, I think our speaker is, is experiencing some, some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? We can, we can hear you now, yes. Can you uh, pull up your slides again? I'm trying. Is this it or? No, no, it's no not in the this one, okay. Okay, uh, you see the slides? Okay, I'm gonna start up from where I thought I lost you. So the... Um, so uh, Henrik von Moki would um, use war games to train the uh, students going through the war college and help the general staff prepare war plans. And if you look at the history of the German War of Unifications, uh, they defeated Denmark, Austria, France, and, and really lopsided victories. And if you look at population, uh, gross national product, tech, uh, technology levels, all the rest, you shouldn't have had such lopsided victories. Well, at the time, uh, many people in many countries attributed that uh, to the use of wargaming, and wargaming spread to a great many other nations. One of those nations that it spread to is the United States. I am trying to go to the next slide. Um, hmm. All right, are you, there we go. Okay, it, it spread to the United States and there was a um, uh, Major Livermore who uh, tried to sell wargaming in the United States. It, he was uh, initially not very successful. Uh, he then went and tried to use the war games to replicate civil war battles. Uh, didn't work at first because the war games weren't bloody enough adjusted it with the actual uh, casualties, given that rifle muskets were used, uh, came much closer to matching the actual outcomes, helped sell it, and it was uh, very well received within the Army. But then a few years later, uh, people at the Army's Command and General Staff College said, you know, the United States is not Prussia. Prussia has big units together in one place. We have people scattered at different cavalry posts all throughout the West, small fortifications, various locations around the coast. Uh, we really don't have the, the, the critical mass to do wargaming the way the Prussians do and the Germans do. So we're gonna use them here in our curriculum. We're gonna start with a one-sided map exercise where it's a canned red and all the students fight against the same red. Then we'll have a two-sided map maneuver where the students against each other a one-sided field exercise, and then a two uh, field maneuver, and then a two-sided field maneuver where um, both the, the, the students fight against each other. And uh, that was used for a lot of years, and it really made a huge difference in our, the effectiveness of our staff officers. Uh, in the Spanish-American War, uh, very, very poor staff work. Uh, after these reforms, when we 
uh, came to fight in World War II, our allies were pleasantly surprised that our staff officers seemed to have done some of this before. Oh, they did it in school. Now, uh, you also have some innovations taking place in Great Britain and the United States. Uh, one is that they're adapting more gaming to the naval use. On the left, you see Tom Jane's of Jane's fighting ships and everything else. Uh, he came up with the early set of naval rules that were used by civilians and military. And the military in the United Kingdom, and this gentleman on the right, the guy with this skimmer hat, is uh, uh, McCarty Little, uh, a gentleman who was retired from the Navy with a disability pension, and for decades supported the Naval War College without getting any more pay than his pension. Uh, and ultimately, though, by special act of Congress, uh, his retired rank was increased to colonel, so kind of a happy ending to the story. But one of the, the key innovations was that war games up to that point had mainly looked at battles, and McCarty Little and others had figured out that now that navies are much more long range and underwater cables allow ships to be ordered around over greater distances, you needed to war game uh, is at greater distances. Then uh, the, uh, all this work in the US, United Kingdom and many other nations resulted in Germany's edge eroding. And, and don't take my word for it, in his uh, retirement speech to the German parliament, uh, uh, Hermann von Melke said that uh, war had been very good for them in building the German state but that other states had caught up to them in staff years. And so we couldn't expect such lopsided, lopsided victories in the future. So we would need to find more peaceful ways of achieving what Germany wanted. And one indication of how other nations had, had caught up late in World War, or at least largely caught up, late in World War I, uh, when, after the defeat of the Soviet Union, the Germans shifted many, many of their forces to the West and tried to have their peace offensive to win the war before the United States could show up in strength. So the Germans conducted a war game, and in that war game, they made a very deep penetration, didn't get to anything strategic, but decided to proceed anyway. Um, at the same time, the British brought over faculties from the British War College that wargaming was part of their curriculum too. So they estimated how many forces the Germans could transfer from the east. They made a guess as to where the uh, attack would take place. And their war game uh, indicated that the penetration would be about the depth that the penetration actually was. So when the attack actually took place, again, the, 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 the ultimate front line of the actual attack was very close to the projections of both the Germans and the British. So I'll tell this for two reasons. One kind of illustrates how other countries had largely closed the gap uh, with the Germans. Uh, Germans still had a deeper bench. Uh, but the other thing is that we as war gamers, almost as soon as you become professional, you, you hear over and over again, war games don't predict the future. They, they don't give you answers. They raise questions. They don't predict the future. They don't predict the future um, to, to kind of be humorous with my students, I would sometimes say, every war game always predicts the future, and several times a century they get it right. Um, you, there's a danger of, of putting too much faith in war games, but there's also a danger of, of, of not putting enough faith. And I think there's a way around that, but we can save that to the Q&A. Okay, now, when we get to the interwar period, we have some very interesting things happening in Weimar, Germany. Uh, Weimar Germany was really weak. Uh, the, 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 they were still in compliance, compliance with the Treaty of Versailles. Their armed forces had shrunk to a tiny size, and they were, were absolutely worried about being conquered by Poland. And the old thing about mother uh, invention being uh, necessity being the mother of invention, they came up with what would later be called Palmyra Wargaming what I call the third generation of wargaming, which is much more comprehensive. They brought in the Krupps and said how long, would, first of all, the war games were held at the Ministry of State, not the Ministry of War. They brought in the Krupps to say how long would it take you to ramp up production in what ways. 
They had people from the state, their, their uh, foreign ministry, people from the, the War Department, people from their War Department, people from a lot of different aspects, uh, looking at what are all the different elements of power that they could use to make that happen. Fortunately for the rest of the world, when, when Hitler came to power, he ordered these war games stopped. Uh, he said it was all pseudo-scientific mumbo jumbo that from now on the decisions on the destiny of Germany would be decided with mud and blood, which doesn't make any sense even in German. Anyway, um, unfortunately though, Hitler didn't stop the war gaming being conducted by the German armed forces. Now, I, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, so let's talk about the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps first. Uh, they very much came up with this cycle of innovation that allowed them to anticipate uh, the future needs of, of warfare. Uh, and the same thing with the German armed forces. They very much designed their, their armed forces, kept in service people who had wargaming experience, and, and very much uh, uh, came up with a, a system of, of looking at how they could fight warfare better in the future. Now, everybody innovates. And one of the things that is really core to this lecture is you know, how can we use wargaming to innovate more effectively? Uh, adversaries also innovate. So it's not enough to innovate. We need to innovate more effectively than they do. Now, the typical way of doing innovation, even, even maybe a little bit better than typical, is to make a conscious effort that you want to innovate. You look at the history, you come up with some theories, there's a competition of ideas that lead to the official doctrine. That doctrine is applied to specific strategies, and then you execute based on that strategy. That execution becomes part of history, and the cycle continues. Uh, the British did that in World War I with tank warfare. A lot of people criticized the British for, for not building many, many, many tanks and then unleashing them all at once and surprising the Germans. Uh, there's, that's, there's really a lot of fallacy in that criticism because early British tanks were rubbish. They were terrible from a technical point of view and the tactics for their employment was even worse. Um, the British quite wisely went through this cycle where they had different cycles of innovation where they learned from their first tanks, make them a little better, learn from the second tanks, make them a little better. Of course, there's several problems with that. It takes time. And the biggest problem is the Germans do see uh, what's going on with your innovation. So as you're making your tanks more effective, uh, they're making their counters more effective. Now, the way the Germans got around that and the way the U.S. Navy got around that and Marine Corps is that they came up with a system where instead of actually applying uh, their new technologies, they applied them in war games. Uh, and you can do that during peacetime. So the, the, the U.S. Navy war gamed out World War II in the Pacific almost every year of the interwar period. And most of those war games we lost. But in, in those games we lost, we really won because we were able to eliminate plans that wouldn't work. And we were able to identify capabilities that would be needed uh, in the event of a war. And we're able to start uh, developing those capabilities uh, when there was enough time during peacetime. Uh, probably the best example of that is we figured out we needed islands closer to Japan, islands that Japan possessed. So the Marines had to develop the ability to do amphibious warfare, something that they didn't have the capability uh, in the early interwar period. So the Marines turn around and use study, analysis, debate, and war games to come up with uh, how they're going to conduct amphibious warfare. Now, it's not all wargaming. A lot of it's technology and other things, too. But there's a, a semi-famous um, incident in the Marine Corps where a Marine Corps officer sees a Higgins boat. And the second he sees it, says, that's what we've been looking for. Well, they were...
Hello, Matt. Can you hear? Can you hear me? We've we've lost you again. We're looking. Matt, we've lost you again. Okay, how about now? We can hear you. Okay, do you see my slides? Not yet. Hmm, okay. Uh, exit maybe, or escape. Let's go back to where we can share. And then play or share slides. The problem is the mouse isn't working. Or is it? Looks like that. Here, two, two. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is, okay. Okay. So play, I think. Okay, do you see him now? Not yet. Okay. Um, Hold on a second. Uh, yeah, share slides. Is it, is it that one or this one? Is that this one? No, I think it's this one. Okay. Try it. We can see a screen, yes. You can see the screen? Okay, yeah. now play. Okay, so so that was the way that uh, both the, the German military and the U.S. Navy conducted their wargaming in war period. In the case of the U.S. Army and the French Army, uh, wargaming was treated very much as a training aid. Uh, the U.S. Army had very little money in the interwar period, and as a result, they did very little wargaming until just before the war. Uh, the French Army uh, recognized that a great percentage of their army uh, was reservists, and so the limited amount of time they had each year to keep these guys sharp, they didn't want to spend in looking at different technologies and different tactics, which is a shame. Uh, the French did do one war game where they looked at an attack across the Ardennes, and in their war game, uh, they assessed that the Germans would be able to get across the Meuse, but they didn't conduct the war game very effectively. Uh, the people playing red or the Germans followed French doctrine, waited for their artillery to show up, which meant the French had time to move up reinforcements. It was still seen as something of a problem, so some reinforcements were sent to that sector. Uh, if they had done more wargaming, they would have had more opportunities to uh, to see if uh, uh, to maybe get a better idea of what was what would happen. And really, there doesn't need to be a dichotomy between using war games to train and using war games to uh, look at better applications of technology and to better tactics and all the rest. Um, hopefully, most people on this call already know a little bit about the war gaming done by the Western Approaches Command. Why this is not a Hollywood movie, I have yet to figure out. I mean, young wrens, some of them engaged to the captains that were off at the, in the ocean, uh, in, in the midst of fights with the U-boats. I mean, you know, I can almost start doing the casting. But it started out as a training aid. The, the early war games were the, 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 the school would bring together captains of escort vessels and captains of the ships being escorted to be taught how to do uh, effective convoy procedures. And then kind of as a graduate, graduation exercise, they would actually conduct the war game. So there were times between classes, and at first, they just used that time to kind of look at different tactics and options and all the rest. And as the war progressed, those better tactics and everything else got fed back into the course. And as many of you know, uh, there's a, there was a case late in the war where they're coming up with different tactics while the fight is going on in mid-Atlantic. So a, a war game that was originally envisioned for, for training becomes very much a tool for developing better ways to, to fight. Okay, then, um, the, the, so World War II ends 
Uh, the U.S. drastically cuts back on war gaming because, after all, we have the atomic bomb now. Uh, Brits cut back. Uh, Germany and Japan isn't doing war gaming at all. Um, the only country that I've been able to, to, to find any evidence of doing significant amounts of work in war gaming uh, was the Soviet Union. It, while this nation is still starving and, and broken in the late 40s and, and early 50s, they're putting a huge amount of effort into developing uh, uh, adjudication routines for their war games based on the actual times it took to cross rivers and travel a certain amount of road and uh, casualties from engagements under certain circumstances. So this did two things. One, it provided them with, with very, very solid criteria for adjudicating their war games, but it also created a war gaming ca capability that was really, really slow. And, and we in the West did a pretty good job of keeping the Soviets from getting too much of our uh, computer technology. So it, it kind of stayed slow. But even so, in the, the late 40s, early 50s, they were ahead of us, all of us, in wargaming. Uh, and the funny thing is, we didn't know it at the time. It would be as if um, Sputnik could somehow be kept a secret and, and we would just catch up and pull ahead of them in the space race without ever knowing we were behind. Uh, and, and we did start catching up. And uh, one of the things that you see is that the U.S. kind of reinvents third-generation wargaming. Uh, the Germans invented it first with their war games played at the foreign ministry because they were too weak to, to uh, succeed with a purely military solution. We started looking at third-generation war games because fighting an atomic war meant losing an atomic war. You might prevail, but, you know, the quotes at the time about the, the uh, the living would be jealous of the dead. So we started developing war games capabilities to look at different elements of national power and a lot of other uh, innovations in the, in the 50s out of Rand and elsewhere, making our war gaming uh, better and better. And as, as the 60s become the 70s and the 70s become the 80s, the US gradually gets better and better at war gaming. In fact, here's just a little snapshot of just how widespread uh, and advantageous our use of wargaming was in the first uh, Gulf War. Uh, first of all, Gallant Knight uh, set us up for success. Uh, Gallant Knight was a war game that was conducted annually that um, looked at a Soviet drive from Afghanistan into the Persian Gulf and what we would need to fight effectively in the theater. We had the wrong enemy. We had the wrong axis of attack, but we correctly identified what we would need to fight there uh, effectively. We needed more strategic lift, pre-position heavy stuff, build a certain amount of infrastructure. So when the Gulf War came along, we had things, we were really set up for success. Um, our uh, air component commander, uh, General Horner, did a war game where the uh, Iraqis kept firing Scud missiles at his air bases. They didn't actually hit anything, uh, but they forced him to do reconnaissance and, and, and hunker down while the missiles were coming in and played havoc with his sortie generation rates. So uh, he was the one who advocated for uh, upgrades to the uh, Patriot uh, warheads and have them move up in the deployment schedule. Internal Look 90, again, why hasn't this been put into a movie? But I talked to several people who actually participated in an internal look that looked at what if we fought Saddam and it took place just weeks before the actual war. So uh, they told me they would be doing the war game and then in a, in a, in a secure area with these make-believe news broadcasts. They would have a couple of sergeants dressed up like they were news forecasters uh, and, and report on what Saddam was doing today and, and different news from the region. And then they would leave the secure area, go out into the break room where CNN was on the TV and hear some of the same things being said. Uh, then you have uh, war gamers at war. Uh, the, the war gaming shop for Central Command would war game out different options for possible strategies and were able to eliminate some bad ideas. Uh, war gaming in the field, um, my co-author on my first book, 
the Gulf War fact book. Uh, um, um, uh, has a, a, a uh, copy of the letter on the wall of his study. Uh, one of our units were using one of his commercially available war games to practice their part of the offensive. And they, they wrote to him saying that the night before there was this big sandstorm and the map and the counters and the rules and everything else was blown out into the desert. So they needed another copy of his game. They couldn't tell them how soon, but they, well, they needed it right away. So please send it quickly. Uh, then the UK did some very innovative uh, stuff uh, during the first war, Gulf War, where they actually had a war game going on in London, and the uh, 7th Armored Division uh, would uh, uh, feed into the war game what they were planning to do as their next maneuver, and then the maneuver would be war gamed out, and the outcome would be fed back to Iraq. And, and this was done in you know 1991. Uh, it, it wasn't continued for all the time because even with the satellite link and computerized war game, uh, the division started moving too fast for the war game to keep up with them. And then one thing we often overlook, but from Top Gun to Red Flag to our National Training Center at Port Rover in California, uh, war games are used to really give us a training edge to create virtual veterans. So when our guys went to the Gulf that time, they had a, a certain expertise, a certain uh, ability to, to adapt and, and to work that were secured from these war games and, and really helped them fight much more effectively. And so what happened is um, people started uh, copying us, but that's another story. Um, so what does all this suggest? All these cases where, where war games evolved and, and had an impact. Well, wargaming is, is a little like poker. Having the second best hand is nice, but not really useful. Uh, the Iraqis wargamed. They wargamed better than the Iranians and gave them an edge, but not nearly as well as the United States. And that was one of so many areas where we in the coalition had an advantage over them. Uh, to keep the best hand, you must constantly advance your wargaming and advance faster than your adversaries. So you can see how the, the Prussians and then the Germans had an advantage. The rest of the world almost caught up to them uh, in World War I. And the advantage that the Germans still enjoyed wasn't enough to, to really be decisive. Over the interwar period, uh, the Germans pulled back ahead again, uh, but then the British and, and we caught up. And again, by uh, the advantage wasn't big enough. The Russians were ahead of us for a few years, but then we pulled ahead of them. There's no reason that we would, we should expect to maintain a, a lead in war game indefinitely. We need to keep getting better and better at adapting if, if we're to, to preserve our advantage. So some of the recent efforts to preserve that advantage, um, one is an increased recognition of the war game industrial base. Uh, any of you folks that uh, are, are members of any of the maritime services, uh, a naval industrial base from the time of Mahan has been recognized as a greatest, great uh, benefit. Uh, connections, we'll talk about that more. Uh, more use of third generation war games. The, the memos out of the United States uh, Department of Defense and then uh, some new work being done in NATO. So um, it's kind of hard to pick a date when uh, the military started taking commercial war gaming seriously. Um, there's always been a certain amount of resistance. I can remember as, as a young officer being told, all that wargaming stuff, that's just Dungeons and Dragons. You know, are you, are you gonna, you know, have orcs attack or what? Um, but over a hundred years ago, uh, Jane's wargames rules were used by both military and civilians. Uh, the United States Army for many years used a set of rules called Dun Kemp, which is not all that different from a commercial set of rules uh, on the same subject. Uh, one of the uh, rather famous examples was our Marine Corps adapted one of the first first person shooters ever produced a game called Doom and they basically wrote new flat files so instead of monsters you would have enemy soldiers and they could train four man fire teams and this got a lot of recognition uh, but in the last 10 20 years there's been an increase in the uh, interest in war games. One of the breakthroughs 
was America's Army, uh, a basically a commercial war game that was uh, created as a recruiting tool for the Army. It was very, very effective. And then the British publisher, uh, Slytherin slash Matrix Games, came up with a game called Command Air and Sea, and then they came up with the Command Professional Edition, Command PE. And this has been quite a breakthrough because a lot of the commercial games that have been used by the military have been used in a training context. Uh, user friendliness is more important in training because you have a limited amount of time and absolute positive uh, accuracy isn't quite as important. You're trying to teach people how to think, not come up with a specific answer so much. Just have to worry about avoiding this training. Well, Command P is actually being looked at and used for, for analysis. So, and, and it would cost us a great deal more money if we could ever create something so user friendly. Um, but yet we could, can get it a modified commercial off the shelf. Uh, then the Connections Conference is, has also been uh, a, a, a benefit for people coming together and exchanging how to do things better. Uh, Connections really started on the eve of Christmas Eve uh, back in 1992. Uh, I was a research assistant for wargaming uh, at the School of Advanced Air Power Studies, and Colonel Warden, who had come up with the instant thunder plan for the Gulf War, was the new commandant of Air Command and Staff College. Uh, he was this living legend. I think at the time I was a major, and I was a major in the reserves, and, and I had been in a couple of briefings he gave, but never introduced. I didn't think he knew me from Adam, and people are starting to leave early. I'm starting to think of what what time could I reasonably leave the office? What what things did I need to do before I left? And the phone rings, and it's Colonel Warden. And he's telling me how I'm unhappy he is with the state of Air Force Wargaming at the time, uh, both operationally and in his schoolhouse. And uh, does anybody do it right? And I would say, well, these guys are doing that right, and those guys are doing that right. And said, well, what could we do? And says, well, we could have a conference where they could learn from each other's um, uh, best practices. And he said, okay. And then he'd ask another question. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, have I been asked to put on a conference? And uh, we talked for three hours. We talked for three hours. And, and, and finally, I get off the phone and everybody has left SAS. The, I'm the, the last one in the office area. It's, it's almost quitting time. I, I don't remember what else I was going to do. And I'm like, did I just be, was I just asked to put on a conference? And I'm like, I can't talk to the Colonel Warden. And if I asked my boss to ask, it would be like, I'm trying to be asked. So I have a bad habit I'm trying to get better, better at. When I don't know what to do, I don't do it. And so we um, went home for Christmas and a while into the new year, I'm walking down the hallway at our command staff college and Colonel Warren's coming the other way, and his whole face lights up, and he says, hey, Matt, how's the conference coming? And I'm like, oh, well, sir, um, I've been giving it a lot of thoughts. Oh, okay, well, I have some time now. No, 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 let me get on your calendar, sir. I, I let's do it. So we've been doing Connections Conference ever since. The first one was held just a few months later in 1993, where we do bring together people from Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, uh, friendly nations, uh, the commercial wargaming guys, academic wargaming guys, so they can all learn from each other. And I'm very grateful to uh, Phil Saban and and Lindsey Graham. Uh, Lindsey Graham, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, and and the whole crew that put together Connections UK. There, there's an old story um, that uh, in a democracy, the most important election is the second one. Well, the most important additional connections conference would be the second one. The United Kingdom showed you could do a connections conference overseas. And so that was followed by uh, Connections Oz, Connections Netherlands, Connections North, and, and this year Connections France, which is uh, a coincident connections and serious games conference. We'll talk more about that. And this year, because of the coronavirus, we couldn't do an in-person Connections Conference in August. So if we're going to do it online, it can be open to everybody. And so we're very much trying to design Connections this year to be a Connections Global. 
And so people from anywhere will be able to log in. We've tried to pick times that are that are friendly to people that are used to sleep patterns in, in UK and, and uh, in Europe and uh, very much uh, looking forward to this being a real breakthrough. And then third generation wargaming, uh, you see wargaming going beyond fire and movement and maybe logistics and intel. Uh, a story out of some of my uh, United Kingdom colleagues where they were uh, wanting to plan ahead future operations in Afghanistan and to do that right they needed to involve the Red Cross and a number of other non-governmental agencies. They wouldn't be interested in per participating in a war game, so they called it a workshop. And they were able to plan through what they needed to do in the next several months, really by looking at all the elements of power. Uh, in Canada, uh, Connections North very much looks at uh, phase four and, and, and much more comprehensive look at, at warfare. Uh, uh, Rex Bryan and, and, and that whole crew uh, really going well beyond just attrition. And then Connections France, as I said, um, they deliberately designed their conference so it's half a Connections conference and half a Serious Games conference. So I, I spoke there just before the coronavirus hit and um, the speaker before me was from the Red Cross and after the talks and the hallway conversation he says you know you guys bring us in after the shooting stop if you bring us in earlier we might be able to to help you figure out how to fight in such a way that we're not needed as much and i said what a great idea um so people are moving are moving war gaming from attrition towards more of a comprehensive approach and that's going to pay off in a lot of ways okay next the memos um, working wargaming in U.S. defense when these memos came out was an interesting endeavor. Uh, first, our Secretary of Defense came out with a memo advocating uh, to, uh, to increase our uh, innovation, and one of the four pillars that he uh, stated in his memo was wargaming, and that was like just earth-shaking. And then his Deputy Secretary of Defense came out with two memos, the first of which said wargaming had atrophied and we needed to turn that around. He had two four-star summits where all the participants in the meeting were four stars, provided incentive money, created a repository of wargame reports so you could now do literature searches for the first time and uh, came up with ways to support wargame practitioners. And then in the case of NATO, uh, there are two working groups right now uh, looking at advancing uh, wargaming within NATO. Uh, one is uh, the, the COA wargaming group, looking at wargames that are more time sensitive. Uh, and, and all wargames need to be conducted within the decision cycle of the decision maker or else they're worthless. But the COA wargame, the, the expedient wargames have a much tighter decision cycle. The analytical wargames uh, tend to look at decisions that you have a much greater lead time on for structure and things like that, so that um, you, you can uh, take a, a more comprehensive look and, and integrate with other methods of analysis and all the rest. And so that's why there's two separate working groups. So um, towards innov innovative wargaming uh, to outthink and outcompete. Um, we were ahead of the world uh, during the Gulf, first Gulf War. We've done a lot since the Gulf War to make things better, but are we still better at wargaming than our adversaries? If a nation is developing a new fighter aircraft, one of the first things they do is find out all they can about the fighter aircraft of their adversaries. If we're trying to make wargaming better, it would seem logical to try to learn all we could learn about how our adversaries were again. Uh, um, and that's something that, that we very much need to do. Another analogy with in the, the world of aircraft, because that's where I come from, is that if you're a nation and you're buying 100 new aircraft, you sit down and you say, okay, I need one and a half pilots for each of these aircraft. So I need 150 pilots. Uh, they need to know these things. 
I have that's my initial training burden. But then every year, a certain number of pilots die, get promoted, retire. So I'm going to need to train a certain number additional each year. Uh, as far as I know, uh, none of the Western nations do that with their war games, our war gamers. Uh, we need to calculate, achieve, and maintain the right size wargaming cadre. And we need to do that every branch of service, every one of our militaries. What is the right number? And what, does di what do different people need to know about wargaming uh, who are in different jobs? Um, we, need to war we need to exploit wargaming tech from the pandemic into the post-pandemic world. We're doing a lot of online and distributed wargaming. And we're doing that because we have to now with the pandemic because of the need for social distancing and minimization of traffic and, spo and uh, exposure. But distributed wargaming could also help us do more wargaming and quicker wargaming and, and wargaming in a tighter OODA loop uh, once uh, the pandemic is over. Uh, we're looking at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and part of this will be to make war games that require fewer players but one of the things the computer guys have been saying since the 1950s is that computer adjudication would allow war games to go faster uh, it's been untrue since the 50s it's pretty much untrue today because while the adjudication may be quicker us pesky humans need to make decisions on how to adjust our plans based on what the enemies are doing well if you have embedded ai you can, you can finally do wargaming faster because the AI is adjusting to how things change. And then finally, we need to develop uh, a third generation of war games uh, to go uh, so that uh, we can look at war more comprehensively and not only win the war, and win, but we can win the peace. And finally, uh, one of the things we need to do is to support global connections. Anybody that can log into this talk can log into connections and uh, contribute and, and help make all that happen. So in conclusion, uh, wargaming more effectively than your adversary has provided an edge over and over and over again. And if you wanna read my book, you'll find a lot more uh, examples of where wargaming does provide an edge. Uh, effective wargames in in require you to improve your wargaming more uh, uh, quickly than your adversary. Uh, so you can never stop making your wargaming better. Uh, advances in wargames can help us create the future we want. When you go to third generation wargames, you can really shift to peace games because if you're looking at all elements of national power to achieve your objectives, then you can also explore how do you achieve those objectives without going to war at all? It should be possible to go from creating war games that look at a win-lose situation to a win-win situation. We can go from outthinking and outcompeting our adversaries to making our adversaries our new partners. Uh, I taught for many years at Air Force Air Command Staff College, and one of the things that I would always tell my students is that you don't really achieve the highest level of victory until you make your former adversary a uh, willing military, uh, an important trading partner, a willing military ally, and a popular vacation destination. And they would sometimes say, isn't that setting the bar kind of high? I said, well, that's pretty much what happened with Germany and Japan. Uh, if we can achieve, uh, if we can take wargaming from wargaming to peace gaming and use it to think out future policies that will make our adversaries uh, uh, our friends, then we can achieve the highest form of victory, a just, prosperous, safe, and lasting peace. Thank you all very much. This is a great honor. I very much look forward to the Q&A. Thank you all. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and be, as we start um, into the Q&A, there were um, some questions on whether to post in, uh, in the chat or the Q&A. Um, 
my colleague James Smith has instructed everyone to post in the Q&A, um, so please, please go ahead and do that. Um, Matt, as, as, as the topic of, of uh, today's conversation is, is about adapting wargaming institutions, um, could you just highlight for us what the key uh, U.S. government institutions um, are that are involved uh, in wargaming today and, and how they're changing? Okay. Um, the, the United States really has a family of wargaming uh, institutions that are each geared to different uh, decision cycles. If, if you think of three circles, you have decisions that are uh, at the strategic level where you've got a decision loop and you're looking at um, what should keep us up at night and what should really keep us up at night and what we need to be preparing for. And that's one decision cycle and that is one type of war game. And then there's the decision cycle of people that are out in the theaters looking at um, how should we fight in this theater? How should we fight in this war? And then there's a third decision cycle that how should we fight in 20 years? What, how is the international uh, environment changing? How is technology changing? How are our adversaries changing? So what new aircraft or ship or, or communications device do we need to start developing now because we're gonna need it in 20 years? And each of these are distinct, but they all feed each other. And probably the best example of how they feed each other is um, shortly after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, our uh, folks that do the palm oil wargaming at the, at the strategic level were looking at a lot of other things the Soviets might do. If they were willing to invade Afghanistan, might they do this, might they do that? And some of those war games showed, well, that wouldn't really be feasible for them to do. Or if the Soviets do that, it, it wouldn't really be that bad for us. But then one of the things they looked at was the Soviets driving from Afghanistan to take the North Shore of the Straits of Ramuz. And that was determined to be really, really bad. Uh, Iran is mainly empty in that part of the country. Uh, it was assessed that they had the capability to do that. Cutting at that time with so much of the world's oil coming through the Straits of Ramuz, that would be bad diplomatically, economically, militarily it would be a really bad thing. Uh, so we started looking at different uh, operations plans as to how to cope with that. Uh, Gallant Knight was the war game that was part of that planning cycle. And year after year after year, uh, we died horribly in Gallant Knight. We were just totally uh, defeated in detail because we showed up at the, at the theater uh, incrementally while the Soviets were able to show up in strength. Because of that though, we, we figured out we needed to pre-position, we needed this, we needed that. And as each year, the war game would lose a little bit less badly. And then even after we got to the point where we could succeed, they said, well, what might the Soviets do in the late 90s? What might the Soviets do in the early 2000s? Uh, nobody ever said war games were perfect. And, and these forward-looking war games would, would look at the same scenario. So you see, one scenario being used at the at the strategic level, up the operational level, and then at kind of the service level, anticipating requirements. And then the final big area where war games are used within our services is education and training, where they're they're used at all the schoolhouses to try to help us become virtual veterans, not just in fighting wars, but in planning them. And then, as I mentioned briefly in my talk, uh, the Navy has Top Gun. I think everybody saw the movie with uh, Tom Cruise and all the rest uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and then the Air Force has something called Red Flag out at Nellis Air Force Base. The Army has the National Training Center at Fort Orrin, where you actually have a live war game, where you have the, the red aggressors following adversary tactics with equipment that's supposed to be similar to the adversaries and, and our guys plan to do that. So strategic operational um, kind of uh, force development and then education and training are the, the big rocks for uh, wargaming within the US. So we have a, a question from Peter Perla. How do you define a lead in wargaming? Or ah, 
or leadership in wargaming and what makes one organization better at wargaming than another? Is it the games or is it how they're used? Ah, very good. Yeah, all the above. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that Peter would, would uh, send in such an insightful question. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's a very, very hard question. Um, the, the kind of, the question, the answer that begs more questions is a, 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 an organization is ahead in wargaming if wargaming helps them to fight more effectively uh, than the other guy's organization. Uh, and, and that's kind of, and I'm not sure that really, it, it's, it's both how effective is the war games and then how widespread is the war games. Uh, probably the best illustration of this is that um, the North Vietnamese use Soviet war gaming methods, uh, which are basically single move war games on kind of a terrain area. And, and they would plan out all their attacks through war games. So they played uh, thousands and thousands of war games during the course of the war, very crude. The terrain models would be more like our army would call a rock drill, uh, very unsophisticated, but they did it over and over and over again. Um, I have found um, two articles about our army using wargaming in Vietnam. Uh, a full bird colonel who was a PhD in operations research brought a micro, mini micro computer as small as a refrigerator uh, out to uh, Vietnam and they did a war game for each of the core areas and very sophisticated stuff, very, very, very impressive. The, the technology at the time was cutting edge. And 06, who was also a PhD, you know, talk about the sophistication of that. Um, I'm not sure if it happened once or twice. I found two articles, but it sounded like they were describing the same event. So you have the, the North Vietnamese wargaming over and over and over again, you know, you know, so many times, so many iterations, so many echelons, and us wargaming three times, one for each core. So you ask, you know, which side was using wargaming more effectively? And, and that kind of gets into the, the, the silly debate about speed versus um, uh, sophistication and analytical rigor. Uh, you know, speed is kind of like ma motherhood and apple pie. Analytical rigor is like uh, motherhood and apple pie. But the two are kind of in conflict with each other. So what I normally say is that figure out when the decision maker needs to make his decision and then you know, work in as much analytical rigor as your time budget will allow. Um, that answer isn't nearly as great as his question, but that's the best I can do. Thank you. Um, a question from Andrew Corbett. You mentioned that wargaming doesn't provide the answer, uh, just more and better informed questions. Are our senior military and political leaders beginning to understand this? Well, we had a Deputy Secretary of Defense that certainly did. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of uneven. And, and that gets back to my talk about uh, we need to figure out um, the, the wargaming education and training requirement, like we figure out how many pilots we need for each new weapon system, or, or how many um, and, and this is not just Air Force. The Army figures out how many tank drivers they need. The Navy figures out how many people they need and, and, uh, for the nuclear power plants and their submarines. And they come up with a curriculum and everything else. There is no, uh, that I have found, anywhere in the world where somebody has taken, at least in the Western world, has taken a step back and said, okay, we need... Uh, people with this, this, so many people with this level of education in wargaming, so many people with this level of education, so many people with a, a familiarization, they need to be in these positions, and um, they, they move every three years, so we need to train another cadre uh, each year to make up for the third that leave. Uh, wargaming, at least in the U.S., uh, and I suspect elsewhere, is almost like a mentorship system where um, there's a war gamer at that organization, and hopefully before he or she retires, 
uh, they mentor the new guy about wargaming. Um, again, uh, when I taught at Air Command Staff College, I taught there 11 years. And so I had a lot of students over all that time. And if this happened once, it would be kind of a nice anecdote. But this happened like four, five, six times. I would get a phone call and it would be, hey, Matt, do you remember me? I was one of your students. I did this class in this year. And, and well, um, I just got put in charge of wargaming and I don't know anything about it. Uh, can we take a few minutes on the phone now for you to bring me up to speed? Uh, and again, that, that's happened like four or six times to me. And, and that should never happen once. We, one, one of the biggest, you know, we, we tend to talk about shiny technology. Uh, better simulators and better hardware and 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 better uh, graphics presentation and and there's something to be said for that but when you look at air-to-air -air combat yes part of it is having a Spitfire or having a uh, uh, a, a, a Mustang uh, competitive hardware but part of it is the pilot you know aces shoot down way more aircraft I think what I think 5% of the pilots shoot down 80% of the aircraft. And there is no effort to create aces among the war game practitioners. And that's something that, that connections can make a dent in, but there really needs to be a formal system where, where governments and militaries look at what their war gaming requirement is and come up with an ongoing program to replace the folks that they know are going to leave. So th this leads into a question by Ignacio Vasquez, who says, uh, um, how can we improve the organizational memory um, to develop the next generation of, of, of war gamers? Oh, very good. A uh, couple of things. One, the, uh, the US has done and other countries I think should emulate. Uh, one of the things that came out of uh, Deputy Secretary Works innovation uh, and initiatives on war gaming was this thing called the War Game Repository where all, uh, dis most of the decisions support the war games that look for future force structure and stuff like that are all put in on a classified database so that if, if you're tasked to create a war game in a particular theater looking at particular subjects, uh, you can go in and see who's done stuff before. Uh, I work at a research lab and um, you never do a technical project without doing a literature search to see what research has been done by others. Uh, that should become part of the practice within, uh, within wargaming. Um, shoot, there was a second thing. Um, so, so that's something that we do that other people can do. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, prof uh, Professor Stephen Downs Martin has come up with what he calls a gray cell that most war game reports only look at what we've learned about war. And maybe there's a hot wash at the end where the game director says, okay guys, shoot your arrows at me. Uh, and he may take notes, <clears throat> but that doesn't go into the formal report. And when he retires and dies, all, that, that, all those lessons learned and how to do the war game more effectively next time uh, leaves with him. So uh, Stephen, came up with this whole idea of a gray cell and and continuity of war games lessons learned is just one of like three aspects of a game cell and and probably not the one he would pick first i would pick it first because by having a, a gray cell report as an annex to your final report you can you can now start uh creating a a, a written corporate memory so you can go back the next time and see uh, what are the lessons learned and by having an X, you don't have to, to send out your dirty laundry when somebody wants a copy of the war game report, you keep that. Uh, so I think that's the, uh, the other big thing that, that we can do to try to keep corporate memory. And then the other part of that is just by creating a school system where you have a certain number of war game slots and a certain curriculum, uh, a, a certain amount of uh, information somebody needs going into that slot, the schoolhouse that does that is a is a, a natural uh, place to to create those lessons learned and to create the uh, the um, 
corporate memory to keep those lessons learned. Uh, in the United States, a big breakthrough in the increased effectiveness of air power was when the Army set up the Air Corps Tactical School down in Montgomery during the interwar period. Uh, the, the people on the faculty of that school were the ones that uh, wrote the Air Force doctrine that went into uh, World War II. So we have an, a number of questions on, on peace gaming um, from Nicola Bates and Anushai Okai. Um, so if, if lasting peace is the highest form of victory, shouldn't we just the naming the name war gaming to peace gaming to reflect that ultimate goal? And what are some examples of how war gaming structures could be used in peace gaming? And how would this be helpful for advancement? Okay, very good. Um, again, probably a better question than, than I'll be able to come up with an answer for. But um, you're probably never going to have war games go away completely because you can try to create conditions for peace, but people don't always go along with that. So you, 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 that, that won't go away. As far as peace gaming, um, I think it's more of a recognition. Um, there's a type of war game called palm oil war gaming, and that's in the U.S. at the strategic level, where you look at what are the problems that you should worry about, what are the problems you should worry about a lot, and part of that is to is they they look at are there ways that all of government can respond to a particular crisis um, so that maybe we don't have to fight in the first place. Uh, now, um, one area to do that better is to look deeper. A lot of our palm oil war games, and we've been doing this since the 1950s, look at crises and they look at initial response to crises and, and what should our first steps be. Um, I haven't seen this in print and, and I can't vouch that it's true, but a, a war game colleague of mine told me that the, the Chinese did a war game that looked out 40 years where you started the war game at today's year and took annual turns and went out 40 looking at all of government and then they were told they didn't look out far enough so they did another one that looked at 70 years and they were told uh 70 years is too squishy you probably shouldn't look out that far so they've they've decided they're going to do these looking out 50 years uh, i'm not aware of anything in the in in, in our side of the wargaming world that, that looks that deep into the future. If we are going to move from wargaming to peace gaming, we not only need to have it all government and really all of, of nation, all, all the elements of national power, uh, but we need to come up with a way that we can wargame over a long enough period of time that we can actually move things towards peace. And I think just using the term peace gaming would be a step in that direction because most war games are how we're, how we're gonna win the war. If we make a conscious decision that our objective is to figure out how we're going to uh, create a state of peace that's advantageous to us, then the game is designed differently and played differently. And uh, as I said, we'd have to uh, look into time deeper. We have a question by Joshua High. So the pandemic gives an excellent example of how science and, and data can support decision making. How do you think we can begin to ensure that senior leaders are open to insights generated by war games that would help ensure well thought through policies? Well, Boy, that's a good question too. Um, part of the solution may be our colleagues in the commercial gaming world. That um, when I talk to a decision maker that played commercial war games as a kid, uh, they're usually much more receptive. Um, and um, and that, that's a benefit that I think most people overlook. Uh, the other thing that we can do is um, people may not have a natural inclination to use of wargaming, but if we start to really look at how our potential adversaries wargame 
and look at how they do their analysis, uh, people tend to be very competitive. And if um, you have leaders that don't want to look at wargaming, that don't want to look at the data, that don't want to do these projections, and they are informed about how other nations are doing this and other nations are getting better results, then um, that's going to create an environment where, where they, they don't want to look like they're not being as, as effective as their adversaries and it would, would kind of push them in the direction of, of paying more attention. Uh, and a lot of conflict is miscommunications and, and misunderstanding. And I think if we understand how each other's war games, that will also make uh, somewhat less likely to have misunderstandings. So we have we have just about a minute left, um, and still quite quite a bit of questions. So Matt, can I uh, can I ask you to turn on your video, please? Um, sure. Let me. I I have tech support, so that should help. Um, what are you doing? Okay, and here. Oops, I'm trying to turn that off. This should work. Okay, do you see me now? Yes. Thank okay. You. My pleasure. Uh, and so the, the we have a final question which is um from from Anna Nettleship uh, at King's. What is your take on the efficacy of new diversity and inclusion efforts within the wargaming community? Uh long overdue. Um Wargaming really has been the province of, you know, old white guys or just white guys. Um, and that hurts for our effectiveness. Uh, I, I, I'm originally from New York City where every ethnic group on the planet, there's that, that terrible old Hollywood movie, um, Men in Black, where there's a throwaway line where there's a treaty so uh, aliens can live on earth but they have to live in New York City because they figured nobody would notice and um, over and over again our effectiveness uh, comes from our diversity and that gets back to um, making a conscious effort to figure out what the curriculum needs to be and how much manpower is needed and, 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 and what the rate of new training needs to be because the way it is now it tends to be mentorship and guild, where uh, an old white guy finds a slightly less old white guy uh, to kind of mentor on how to do wargaming. And mentorship tends to be somebody you have something in common with. And, and you can try to make a conscious effort to mentor more, more diversely, and, and you can make some progress in that area. But if there's some more formalized pipeline of people coming into wargaming, then from the beginning of that pipeline, you can make a conscious effort to make sure the intake is diverse. And I think when you do that, you're going to have a sufficient improvement in the quality of your wargame. So it's, it's not only the right thing to do, but it will help us to outcompete and outthink our adversaries by wargaming that much more effectively. That's, that's a perfect note to, uh, to end today's public lecture. Matt, thank you again very much for, for joining us today. And I would like to extend my thanks to, to our colleagues at King's, James Smith, Anna Nettleship, and Francesco Ragazzi, who have been um, supporting the, the execution of uh, this, this webinar series. I would, uh, Anna, can you turn your video on? Um, James and, and Francesco, can, can you turn your videos on or, or audio? Well, th and thank you very much to, to the participants uh, and uh, attendees on Zoom and on, on YouTube. Thank you very much for your excellent questions. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have time to answer all of them, but 
um, we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all.